From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Donald Trump ducks out of the first Republican debate scheduled for Wednesday in Milwaukee, saying his lead is so large and he's so well-known he doesn't need to debate. He also said he won't attend the second debate, which is scheduled for the Reagan Library in California on September 27th. Will his absence hurt the former president's uh, standing and his large lead in the polls? And how will his competitors respond? Welcome. I'm Paul Jigo with the Opinion Pages of the Wall Street Journal here with Kyle Peterson and Kim Strasso. Welcome to both of you. So the debate scheduled for 9 p.m. Eastern time on Fox News, moderated by Brett Baer and Martha McCallum, who say they will ask questions questions about Donald Trump, whether or not he shows up. Now, I'll admit, uh, Kim, I thought he would show up. I didn't think he'd miss a chance to be the center of attention. That would seem to have been the Trump history. But instead, he's going to do an alternative programming uh, of some kind with Tucker Carlson, the former Fox host, wherever Tucker is broadcasting these days. I'm not sure. But were you surprised Trump won't show? Yes, I think I'm going to be surprised he's not going to show. That is if he really doesn't show, because you just never know with Donald Trump, right? And it's really noticeable to me that the head of the Republican National Committee, Ronna McDaniel, is saying that they're still holding out hopes that he might still change his mind, which suggests that they're willing to throw a final lectern up there on stage at the last minute if he does decide to swoop back in. But Look, I think this is potentially a mistake for Trump. I understand the rationale behind it. He feels that he has this image as a front runner. He doesn't want to get down into the fray. He knows that he's going to be attacked. But two things. One, as you said, I'm surprised because he does like to be the center of attention. And this is going to be a big moment, the first time that we've seen all the candidates together. But two, I think that this potentially gives a big opening for some of his competitors to have the stage to themselves, even if they're the ones getting attacked. And I'm surprised that he would allow that to happen. That's interesting. Uh, We're saying that Chris Christie, when he came to see us uh, a few weeks ago, said that he thought Trump would be there for sure at the first debate because he knew he wouldn't be in the second because he doesn't like the Reagan Library. And I think the head of it is Fred Bryan. So Christie thought he would show up for this one because we don't know when the third debate will be if there is one. Trump apparently hasn't ruled attending later debates, no doubt, if he feels the mood. Kyle, I guess he probably feels, like Kim suggested, he just doesn't want to expose himself to attacks, which he knows will be coming, certainly from Chris Christie, who's advertised that fact on the same stage. He has a support of 50 percent or so of Republicans nationwide in the polls, 42 percent in the Des Moines Register poll in Iowa that just came out. And that's a good poll uh, statewide. They do a good job. So why take the risk? I guess it's that simple. Uh, Or is it, I suppose there's also, he wants to get back at Fox, which he thinks has not been nice enough to him of late. I would say probably all of the above. But on the point about whether it strategically makes sense, you also have to factor in that he knows the incentives that all of these other candidates who are polling in the low double digits or in the single digits, similar to the dynamic in 2016, they want to be the last man standing to take on Donald Trump. And so you saw in the documents that were posted by a political consultant tied to the super PAC supporting Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, One of their pieces of advice for Governor DeSantis in the coming debate was to defend Donald Trump in response to an attack from Chris Christie. And this was the same sort of dynamic we saw play out in 2016, where everyone kept hoping and assuming that political gravity would take hold and that Donald Trump would eventually fall in the polls. And then it just never happened. So part of this might be him saying, even if I even if I don't show up to the debate, there's probably going to be some of these candidates who are going to defend me anyway, sort of quasi surrogates, even though they're running their own campaigns. The other thing that I would point out also is that Donald Trump does not qualify for this debate because one of the rules is you have to sign a pledge saying that you would support the eventual Republican nominee, even if it is not you. And Trump has refused to take that pledge, saying there are at least a few of these guys that he could not support as president against Joe Biden. And so he also has that excuse where he can blame the Republican National Committee for shutting him out if he decides that's advantageous. But he hasn't done that. That's not what he's saying to justify it. And by the way, Chris Christie has also said he's not signed any piece of paper that says he'll support the nominee because he's clearly not going to support Trump again. So 
I'm not sure some of the others on stage necessarily would. Asa Hutchinson, for example, if he qualifies, I don't know that he would support Donald Trump. So that strikes me as that Republican National Committee qualification standard strikes me as, at this stage, pro forma, Kyle. Yeah, that's true. I do think that that's playing into his mentality as well, because if it starts to look like a mistake, if it starts to look like he should have shown up for the debate, I don't doubt that he will go on Truth Social and blame the RNC for his choice. It gives him a a little bit of an out, even if it is essentially cover for what he wanted to do anyway. Let's talk a little bit, Kim. I want to explore a little bit your point about that gives an opening to the rest of the field, because I think that that is one of the two potential risks here I think that Trump is taking. Somebody might break out, making a big impression, be able to break out of the pack and emerge as a solid second. The other thing I think is a risk for him is that some voters may conclude he's taking the nomination for granted. They think he's got it won, so it doesn't need really to answer questions, can rise above it, just soar past it and get the nomination almost by coronation. I think that is what he thinks. (laughs) And I wonder how will voters react if they start to think the same? Iowa is a very, very dicey place to make that kind of calculation. That would be my point, is that it is a unique state and the caucus is entirely designed to make people think through because of the way the caucus works to not necessarily make up their minds because they have to think about who they'd go for a second or a third, which corner are you going to stand in in the building if your guy doesn't make it. So it's a place where I think minds are a little bit more open. And then I would look into that Des Moines Register poll that you just mentioned, 42%, yes, saying that they're supporting Donald Trump, followed by 19% for DeSantis, 9% for Tim Scott. But dig in a little bit in that Iowa poll, about two thirds of Trump voters, those who say that he's their first choice, have said their mind is made up. They did the calculations that puts them at about 26 percent of Iowa voters. The poll also found that 52 percent of voters said that their minds absolutely aren't made up, that they are actively looking at all of the candidates And some other interesting numbers in there, for instance, that for those who say that they are Republican caucus goers, but who label themselves as independents, Trump and DeSantis are nearly tied. Trump has 21 percent. DeSantis has 19 percent. Ann Seltzer, who is the pollster who does that poll, had a great line. She said, I've been doing this for a long time. We've had candidates who started low and ended up winning. Anyone can come to Iowa and win anyone. And, you know, if you look back in 2016, Iowa was a tough place for Trump. Ted Cruz won it. And he did it by going to all 99 counties, by doing very small gatherings, working the state. That is traditionally how you win Iowa. And that's why I think Trump is potentially making a mistake by not getting up on the debate stage, by having snubbed so many Iowa leaders and Iowa events, because there's still five months before that caucus. And this is a state where things can shift and shift fast if there's a jolt, if someone breaks out. And I think this debate is potential for somebody to do that. So I just think it's a big risk for him. 